Morning all, welcome to TEDx in Bristol. Um, I've had a fascinating life. I've been very lucky and very blessed to have ended up working with some very interesting people. I seem to have in some way ended up working with entrepreneurs most of my working life. When I started working back in the early days uh, of the late 1970s, I was fascinated by a company called Virgin. I studied history and economics at Aberdeen University. I'd been brought up in Edinburgh and Virgin entered my life as a record shop in Frederick Street in Edinburgh underneath my dad's architectural practice. And I used to go in there as a teenager and listen to the headphones that they had in the record shop. And it was the only record shop in the country where you could go in and listen to the headphones to the music you were going to buy in the 1970s. It later became the Virgin chain of mega stores. And for me, it was the trendiest record shop to go to. So I loved Virgin. And I wanted to find out more about the company and the man that was behind it. And interestingly enough, I eventually started working for Virgin in the mid-1980s. And when I arrived there, I started to look at the history of the company. And the fascinating thing for me was, was that I found an interview that Sir Richard Branson had done in 1968-69, uh, as Virgin was first starting. And he said a number of things. One of the things he said was that, he wanted to do lots of different things for young people. And that they decided to call the record company uh, Virgin because they were all virgins in business and didn't have any experience. But his cousin Simon Draper had wanted to call this record company Slip Disc Records. But he had said to Simon, his cousin, how could we call it Slip Disc Records? Because you couldn't use that name on lots of other things and do lots of other things differently. And also you couldn't put it on an airline tail fin. Now, this was a man who was 18 and a half years old. He admired a man called Sir Freddie Laker, who had an airline called Laker Skytrain, which was probably one of the first low-cost airlines in the world. And he was thinking, even at that age, about his brand. He was thinking about it in a very simple way. He just th thought he'd like to do lots of different things for young people. And he also was thinking about how he was going to achieve that. So the new company they set up, he'd run a student magazine called Virgin, uh, called uh, Student when he left um, uh, college. And as he left college to run this student magazine, his headmaster had said to him, Branson, you're either going to go to jail or become a millionaire, and I predict it'll be in the next five years. Well, in the five years that followed leaving college, he became a millionaire and he went to jail. <laughs> and he intrinsically believed in the idea that he could do things differently. He was dyslexic. He didn't really know he was dyslexic because the word dyslexia had barely been invented in the UK. It was an idea, an airy-fairy idea from the uh, USA at the time. It wasn't really understood or known about. He was considered to be slightly stupid at school because he wasn't very academic. And yet, the person I started working for in 1987 I thought was furiously, geniusly bright because of the way he thought about things. So clearly there was some sort of disconnect in the world of understanding of dyslexia in those days. But being a dyslexic, he had a very, very simplistic way of looking at very complex problems. And interestingly enough, if you look at what Virgin eventually began to morph into over the next few years, if you show that to an academic who studies dyslexia and attention deficit hyperactive disorder, they would immediately recognise that that's the creation of somebody who has those characteristics in their mind. Yet for Richard, this was simplicity itself. He didn't see the way he was structuring Virgin and creating different companies as anything complex. He saw it as simple. He saw a simple brand called Virgin. He created the brand very simply. The Virgin logo you see today is an exact example of the way Richard Branson would behave. Because if we go back to this, this is the original Virgin logo. And when he'd made his first million by signing Mike Oldfield, who had failed at every record company he'd gone to with an album he'd created called Tubular Bells, and Richard Branson signed him, recorded it, and created the best-selling album of the 1970s, which made his first million, he then went on to find a band called the Sex Pistols. And the Sex Pistols didn't like this logo because Johnny Rotten regarded it as a bit hippie-ish. So Richard had to get big guys in to design a logo for him. So look at the logo there. It's a famous logo, globally. And interestingly enough, it was designed in 10 minutes. 
Two people went to see Richard Branson on his houseboat in the late 1970s as the Sex Pistols were recording their first album. And they went to see him and they had the iPad of the day with them, a piece of paper and a felt tip pen. <laughs> and as Richard was describing what he wanted to do with Virgin and what he wanted to make it and how he wanted to make it doing this and doing that and I was, he was going to go into this business and that business, the person in front of him was doodling and literally doodled the word virgin as you see it today. Richard saw it over the table and said, that's it, that's the logo. The complex idea of creating a new logo, you often read in the newspapers that British Airways has spent 30 million pounds designing its new logo and one squiggle has changed. You often read uh, about how long the process has taken. This was somebody who could take a decision and create simplicity out of a complex problem in their head very quickly. And it was a fascinating organisation to join. And a few years later, I joined it. Now, by the time I joined Virgin, I'd been a helicopter search and rescue crewman in the North Sea after leaving university. I'd become a graduate trainee with Thomas Cook. <coughs> and I loved the travel industry, but I also loved the entertainment industry. Because I'd been student union president and put on lots of bands at the Students' Union in Aberdeen. So I intrinsically still had this love of Virgin. And as a graduate trainee with Thomas Cook, my next example of complexity becoming simplicity happens when I'm a graduate trainee in the inc incredibly glamorous town of Croydon. Now, Croydon had beckoned me as I became a graduate trainee with Thomas Cook with a brochure that they sent me saying, come and sample the downtown Dallas-like atmosphere of Croydon. And uh, I arrived there, and it was not downtown, Dallas-like. But in the shop, uh, I was in the shop very near to Gatwick Airport, where Croydon is, uh, is nearby, and it was the summer that Virgin Atlantic launched the airline, June 1984. And two interesting things happened. <coughs> One was um, that a magazine arrived on our desks just as Virgin was about to launch called Marketing Week magazine, and there was an article in it with a survey of the British public which said that only 8% of the British public would be prepared to fly on an airline called Virgin. Uh, and with such qualitative comments as, what is a record company doing going into the airline business? Now, the following week, and one of the reasons I really wanted to go and work for this company, the following week, Marketing Week magazine arrives again, and there's an article by a young Richard Branson. And it was on the front of Marketing Week, it was Richard Branson replies, da 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 da. And in it, this young Richard Branson wrote, congratulations, Marketing Week. I've done no market research on the launch of our new airline called Virgin Atlantic, but I can tell you that it's really exciting because we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we're going to do this. We're going to have a thing called premium economy eventually. We're going to have upper class, which is going to be a business class fare with first class service. We're going to put seat back television in. We're working on that now. Just this whole range of things he was going to do. And for him, it was incredibly simple. He said, he said and the great news is I'd not done any market research on the name because we haven't started the airline yet. I thought it was a bit Henry Ford-like. I thought, you know, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they'd have asked for a faster horse, and therefore, I didn't ask them about that. I found out what people didn't like about airlines. And by the way, I've only got one aeroplane, so you've just given me 24,000 years' worth of customers by saying that 8% of the British public are prepared to fly on my airline. That's the way he saw it. He genuinely saw it like that. He had no fear of failure, no fear of risk, and he was clearly somebody who was creating a business with very simple ideas. And those simple ideas came from a man called Sir Freddie Laker, whose own airline, Laker Skytrain, had gone bust as a cartel had uh, taken it apart in 1982. And Freddie had been sea rich, and in fact, the second time he came to see him about the airline as it was getting going, I was privileged enough to be there. And Freddie Laker made it quite clear that the thing that had made his airline fail, the simple thing that made it fail, was he only went for price competition. He didn't go for quality as well. And he thought increasingly consumers demanded both, and they would do more and more in the future. Something that's become much truer today than it was in those days. And Richard then decided to base everything Virgin did on the concept in his head of quality and value for money, and challenging people, and challenging markets, and challenging ideas. I.e., he decided to make Virgin an entrepreneurial brand. And that the brand would be what Virgin stood for, and it wouldn't matter what the company did. It wouldn't matter how many of those businesses were started. They would all work just the same way in the simple idea of the brand precepts. And how he would look after the people who worked for the Virgin companies, he created this simple idea that came out of this meeting with Freddie Laker. He realised that whenever he read documents that came from uh, companies that quote on the stock market, they always, put, they always said, put the shareholder first. 
And he thought that was reverse logic to him, because he said, if you look after the people who work for you, they're going to look after the customers better, and then the customers will create more value for the shareholders in the end, so they will benefit at the end of the day. It was actually a very simple way of looking at it, but again, it worked. Now, over the years that Virgin existed, we did lots of exciting and interesting things. Richard didn't see any of them as complex. They were incredibly complicated things to do, some of them. I'll give you one example. The one example that, that particularly sticks in my mind because I founded the company is Virgin Trains. Now, Virgin operates a very complex franchise called the West Coast Main Line that in 1997 was in terminal decline with 50-year-old trains and track that had not been refurbished since the late 1960s. And the interesting thing that happened was, was that we did make it the most successful railway in the United Kingdom. And that is because of the simple idea that Richard had at the heart of it. He simply said, this is the one franchise that the government's offering to bid for, which is long, it's 15 years, and it has the opportunity for you to design and build a new train. It was a franchise nobody else wanted at the time because they thought it was too complicated. He saw it in an incredibly simple light. He said, just like an airline can do, if it competes in a marketplace, it can double the number of people flying on the route by bringing down prices and by increasing frequency of service. So let's introduce a brand new train. We're going to design it from scratch. Now, I worked on the design of the train. It's called the Pendolino train. It still operates today. It has uh, doubled the number of people traveling on that railway in 15 years. British Midland no longer flies to Manchester from London, partly as a result of the success of the London to Manchester route. The journey time fell to just over two hours to Manchester. The number of trains doubled on the network. Passenger numbers more than doubled on the network, and it became, instead of the biggest loss making railway in the British structure of railways, it became the most profitable railway. And actually, the taxpayer usually earns about £200 million a year back from this railway now. So it really has worked, but it was based on incredibly simple precepts of simply saying if you can put frequency, speed, and hold the price relatively stable in real terms, you will double the number of people using it and you will create profitability. And that is simplicity itself. And the complex problem of actually doing it, bankrupted rail track, a network rail had to be created. It put a lot of pressure on Virgin financially, but at the end of the day, after five long years, we did it. Space for Richard Branson was a similar thing. So how does it come about that the man who brought you the Sex Pistols ends up, quite simply, building the world's first commercial spaceship? And the answer to that, again, is this simplistic view that he can extrapolate out of things. It all started, really, with a conversation with Buzz Aldrin, as you have in a bar in Marrakesh in 1996-97, which I was privileged, like Forrest Gump, to be present at. And, uh, Richard asked Buzz Aldrin a simple question. He said, why did NASA always launch big rockets from the ground when they're so expensive and, it's so, and it feels to me that it's just intrinsically dangerous? And Buzz said, you're absolutely right, Richard. They did end up doing that because all the other things that they tried were too complicated to achieve the simple goal. And I remember him saying the simple goal of getting a man to the moon. Once NASA was given that goal by President Kennedy, Richard, then it had to big, build a big rocket like that, a big simple rocket, now, when I say simple, it was not simple. There were 200,000 moving parts in the Saturn V rocket, at least. But the thing is, it was based on the simple precept of a huge amount of power blasting a tiny payload as far as the moon. And the ideas, the more elegant ideas that Buzz Aldrin mentioned to Richard, like, for instance, launching rockets from balloons, which they were discussing at the time, or indeed air launching, got torn away because they needed the goal of getting to the moon. The simple goal led to an incredibly complex rocket, which did a simple task of taking a small payload a long way, but then became the rocketry that was obviously used for military purposes and the rocketry that was used for future uh, satellite launches and for all other purposes. And the other methodologies of getting into space, such as an air-launched vehicle like this, simply went by the wayside and were forgotten about, actually, largely. The X-15, in the early 1960s, had taken 200 people into space, including Chuck Yeager, and it had gone a very, on a very successful program with relatively... There was one accident during the whole period, and it was abandoned because it wasn't capable at that time, technologically, of doing more than just getting up into the edge of space, because 
the materials technology wasn't there. And that often happens. Often, very simple solutions to problems don't work in the early days because of materials technology. And entrepreneurs are usually the people who realise that and are prepared to pick them up and go with them again. Very rarely can big corporations do it. Interestingly enough, I had direct experience of this from my own family. My grandfather, Harold Whitehorn, in 1927, invented the world's first petrol electric car and patented it, the Whitehorn Fiat prototype. And it is in the Science Museum in Swindon. And it was incredibly complex as a car, partly because they didn't have microchips in those days to manage it. So you had big rheostat on the steering wheel, you had supercapacitors in it, you had banks of batteries, but it actually worked very well. And it was there to solve a very simple problem. The simple problem was that London transport in the early 1920s with the old fashioned crash gearbox was going through a gearbox every seven or eight weeks. And they commissioned some work to be done on a solution to finding a vehicle that didn't need a gearbox. And my grandfather came up with the petrol electric vehicle. The uh, electric motor ran the wheels and it was a simple solution but the vehicle was incredibly complex. And because of that, it only made it into buses. But actually, a lot of London's buses, until after the Second World War, when the Routemaster bus came in, were indeed petrol-electric buses. But it took 70 years for somebody to come along and commercialise that technology in the form of the Toyota Prius, and now all the range of petrol-electric vehicles that we have on the road. In fact, I took delivery of a petrol-electric vehicle this week, a Mitsubishi Outlander, and it would have been the first one, I think, that my grandfather would have thought was really worth buying of the new petrol-electric plug-in hybrids because it was close to the principles that he had created in 1927. So it often takes a long time. Simple ideas, the complexity of technology to start with means that they don't work. And people like Richard Branson really understand that very well. So he came up with the idea that we should develop a space program based around a spaceship that Paul Allen was having built to win the X Prize in 2004. That's the little spaceship up there, the White Knight and Spaceship One. And underneath it, you see what we developed out of it. And again, based on some very, very simple presets. What did people want to do if they went into space? What did we want to do with space? And could it be done? And the answer is that by the 1990s, early 2000s, it was going to be possible to build a space launch vehicle based on those principles of the X-15 with air launch because the materials technology of carbon composites had come along and Richard said, let's go and build a spaceship. He didn't think about the 15 years it was going to take to get this program to where it is today, about the possibilities that were going to be undertaken of trying to make this technology work in a commercial sense because he had cut through right to the chase. And he said, go out there and let's do it. And we built a business plan around this based upon the fact that people wanted to experience weightlessness if they went to space as tourists, and that if you wanted to make space work for scientists, doing microgravity experiments, you need a lot of space in the spaceship so that they could work on experiments. And if you wanted to make it work for launching some small satellites, it was a sweet spot size for the White Knight 2 to launch the unmanned satellite vehicle. Therefore, we came up with Spaceship 2. It could carry six people into space who could all move around the cabin and experience weightlessness. It could carry scientific experiments with scientists into space, and it was capable of carrying maybe up to a 200 kilo satellite, 150 kilo satellite, and launching it into space from an unmanned launcher. Therefore, it was a multiple business plan. It could work very well, and it all looked simple. Those were the ideas. Tourism, science, training, payloads, and patented IP would lead to a profitable business. That is the spaceship itself that was built, and sadly, of course, due to pilot error, there was a terrible accident two years ago. One of the pilots was killed. And yet, the way that Richard Branson sees it is, that's a tragedy, but we must move on. And he has carried on investing and has now built a new spaceship and a spaceport to go with it. Um, the interesting thing is, is how did, you, how did we do what was actually a quite a complex project with simple goals? And taking a leaf out of his book, I tried to look into the past and find people who had done complex things in the most simple way that they could. And I found a guy called Kelly. Now, Kelly was an engineer at the end of the Second World War. And Kelly had a very, very good idea. He had an idea to do something he'd been asked to do by his bosses. And his bosses had asked this. He said, we've only got Mustangs. The Russians have now got MiGs. 
we don't have a jet fighter, we need to build one, and we need to do it quickly. And Kelly founded an organization called Skunk Works. And Skunk Works, which uh, started in 1946, basically built one of the America's first successful jet aircraft in a relatively short period of time. And Kelly came up with 14 rules as to how he would make this special project work. And they, they, called, they became known as Kelly's Rules. You can look them up on the internet. And we actually, in our little team, 42 of us, who built the spaceship system, which was finished in 2010 to begin testing then, we followed those Kelly's Rules. So we looked back into history. We looked at somebody who tried to do a very complex project in the most simple way, Richard's simple precepts of what he wanted to achieve with the project, and we successfully built the spaceship and started testing it in 2010. And this is the second of the two spaceships that were built. The first one, and we said, had a tragic accident. This is the new one. It's just been rolled out. It's got all the learnings of the previous one, and you can see its size there from that Range Rover that's pulling it out onto the tarmac. And this starts testing in a few weeks' time, and I wish Virgin Galactic every success with it. And this is the guy that still thinks relatively simply about his spaceship and what it can do and loves the project very much and is stewed by it through thick and thin. Now, I've gone on to learn a lot from working with Richard Branson, and I'm going to tell you a couple of the things I've learned. One is that, you know, simple ideas usually work well, even if the solution to them is very complicated. And one is this, 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 this building here. I got taken on after I left Virgin in 2010, um, I got taken on as a non-exec director at the uh, Scottish Exhibition and Conference Centre in order to help them get this building built. Because the architects who built this building had uh, based some of its design precepts on the spaceport in New Mexico that had been built for us, and uh, they thought I'd be helpful in the project. I'm now chairman of this organisation, the, the, the Scottish Exhibition and Conference Centre, and this piece of technology here has, again, very simple ideas behind it based upon the research that was done. What would happen was that the, the people who ran the, the Scottish Exhibition Conference Centre would realise that Scotland had no big indoor arena. And actually the market, especially in Glasgow and Strathclyde, was very strong. Because not surprising, you'll, you'll, you'll learn that the Glaswegians spend more on live entertainment than any other people in Europe. And uh, they like to go out a lot. But you might also know that the weather in Glasgow is not the best. So going to Hamden Stadium to watch artists is not really that good when it rains about 210 days of the year. So building a building that could work as a second sort of national centre after the O2 was the precept. And the market, we said that to ourselves, the market's there for it. What is it about all the arenas that we've gone to that doesn't work very well? And the idea that we came up with was that if you could build an arena, and in, in the case of this, to put it in simple terms, the O2, this building, this building, the furthest away seat from the recording artist playing to you in this building is nearer the nearest seat in the O2. And the way that's been achieved is by building upwards like a Roman kind of Colosseum, because if you think logically, they were one of the easiest ways to see the performance that you were watching. And as a result of that, you can get 13,000 people into this building, and the nearest one of them is very close to the artist. The furthest away one is still closer than the nearest seat in the O2. And there are no pillars because it's got a geodesic roof. And that means a geodesic design of the structure of the roof uh, means that you don't need any pillars because the roof is self-supporting and therefore the customer experience is fantastic. So all the things I'd learned from Virgin, we kind of applied in the way we looked at this business. And it's actually been a massive success. It's turned the Scottish Exhibition Conference Centre from a business that was largely or majority owned by Glasgow City Council that never really made much money just broke even most of the time into an extremely profitable organisation for the city and its people, but it's also one that's transformed the centre of Glasgow. In fact, it's transformed it to such an extent that in the centre of Glasgow at this moment in time, it has regenerated this whole area around about, and it has uh, brought jobs, it has brought new restaurants, shops, and about, it has an economic impact to the tune of nearly a billion pounds a year, based upon a simple idea, executed well, and it's now the third busiest arena in the whole world. I also applied it when I came to work with a couple of other entrepreneurs, the Bruce Brothers. Now, they've just started a business called Purple Bricks. Purple Bricks is actually now, in the space of 20, 24 months, the fastest growing and nearly the third largest estate agent in the UK. And it's based upon the very simple principle of 
What do people want? It turned out that people didn't want online agencies by themselves. Online estate agencies had been around since 2004, and none of them had really worked that well. They'd only captured about 3 or 4% market share in, now, in, in the whole period of the last 10 or, 10 or 12 years since they'd existed. And the traditional estate agents had kept most of the market, despite the fact that traditional estate agents were hated by the public and not popular because they charged big commissions and they would always haggle with you and all the rest of it and customer service wasn't deemed to be good. This business started from the precept that people wanted help when they bought a house. They couldn't do it online because it was too complex for them. And the Bruce brothers, who again have these same characteristics, the same characteristics Richard Branson has, that Steve Jobs had, that Freddie Laker had, that almost every entrepreneur you come across, a lot of them have not succeeded well at school, but they're very bright. And a lot of them had either ADHD or some form of attention deficit disorder or dyslexia. The Bruce brothers had a simple view of this, that if they could create a really good online product with a call center to help people and local property experts, but no bricks and mortar, who could work off the platform, go into your home, do everything online with you at home, get your house sold quickly, and only charge you, including VAT, about a thousand pounds, then they'd be on to a winner. And sure enough, it has been. It, uh, it quote on the stock market a few weeks ago, and it's been hugely successful as a business. It's very complex, the way its web offer works in internally, but for you, the member of the public, it's very simple. And that is really, to me, the great lesson of business that I've learned in my life, that complexity itself increases all the time. As our population grows, complexity increases. As we, as we grow not only in numbers, but our technologies change, complexity increases. But people who can hone down things to simple ideas and then implement them are able to make that complexity simple to all of us. And as a result of that, we get greater utility in our lives. Thank you very much.